We're finishing up a three-part series called I Love My Church, and we're talking about why we love our church. You know it's okay to love your church, right? I believe it. So the first week we said that I love my church because my church is alive. And if you've been a part of this church, you know that it's alive. The presence of God is here. You see him moving and working. Last week we said I love my church because my church is family. This isn't just a place you come. This is family. And we want to support you and care for you. So we encourage you. You can only be cared for by the church if you're connected to the church. You've got to come regularly. I encourage you to serve. I encourage you to join a life group and get plugged in so that God can use you to change the world and build the kingdom of God. Tonight, I want to talk about this. I love my church because my church is changing the world. Yes. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But here's a sad fact. Every week in America... There are 100 to 200 Protestant churches that close, that close their doors. And I don't say that to bum you out, but so that you know how important it is to be a part of and to build a growing, healthy church. We know we talk about churches closing. We know that in the end, the church of Jesus Christ will be victorious because Jesus is victorious, right? But in the meantime, we've got to take advantage of this opportunity and not take it for granted. Now, here's what you have to do to be a healthy, thriving church, but also follower of Jesus. John 15, verse 5. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. How many of you know that apart from Jesus, you can do nothing? You know because a lot of you have tried, right? I've tried. We tried substances and sex and getting more money and getting more influence, more power. But you realize apart from him, apart from Jesus, You can do nothing. There's nothing that satisfies you. There's nothing that really matters at the end of the day. But with him, if you're connected to him, your life will bear fruit. He promises your life will bear fruit. And that's why this church bears fruit, because we are focused on Jesus. And that's what you have to do to be a thriving, growing church. You have to focus on him. You have to be connected to Jesus. And you have to do what he says to do. So this is our mission as a church. Everything we do is so that people far from God can experience new life in Jesus. That's our motivation for every single thing we do. People will say, you know, why do we do that? Why do we sing that? Why do we have that outreach? Why do we start that ministry? Why do we do small groups? Why do people serve? All of your questions, this is the answer. (laughs) It's so that people far from God can experience new life in Jesus. We want to help lost people find new life And then we want to help Christians live out their new life. Both are very important. People will ask sometimes, is your church more geared towards evangelism or discipleship? And I'll say, yes, exactly. That's exactly right. You've got to find new life, but you've also got to live out new life. You've got to become more like Jesus. That's discipleship. That's evangelism. So for for now, it's been four years. Four years, Generation Church has been one of the 100 fastest growing churches in America. Four years in a row. Last year, we were the fastest growing church in Arizona, and we were the 17th fastest growing church in America, actually. And it's been exciting. It's been fun to be a part of what God is doing. We give him all the glory and all the honor. Um, But I have to warn you. I have to warn you, church. When your church grows, things are going to change. Living things grow and growing things change. And change can be hard. It can be challenging. But as a church, we'd rather go through challenging seasons of growth than easy seasons of death. It's easy to die and do nothing. It's hard to keep going and growing, but we're willing to do what God has put us here to do. So we've been growing, we've been expanding, we've been adding more services. Man, our services in the AMs this morning were just packed out. Some of you came to the PM services, you moved to make more room in the AM services. We've been adding chairs, and here we're now at a critical point in the history of our church. So I have an exciting announcement for you tonight. 
Generation Church is alive and growing. We're truly experiencing a move of God, but we're running out of room. If we don't act soon, we'll run out of space for lost people who still need Jesus. That's why it's time for Generation Church to build. Our mission is bigger than our current capacity, so we must make room. We can't add any more chairs and our kids' spaces are full, but you have loved ones who still need new life in Jesus. We will do whatever it takes to reach them. This new facility will allow us to welcome even more people from our community into our church family. We'll double the capacity of our main auditorium to 1,100 seats so we can gather and experience the presence of God. And we'll also be doubling the capacity of our chapel services as they move up into our existing main auditorium. We'll more than triple our total kids ministry space and break learning environments down to more focused age groups. We know that God is calling us to dream big and stretch our faith. It's not going to be easy, but with God, all things are possible. Because we have such a hope, we are very bold. Let's join together and change the world for Jesus. Let's go. So good. So exciting to be a part of this season and what God's doing here. I mean, we've been waiting. We've been kind of seeing that eventually we were going to run out of space and we'll have to do something. I felt like we needed to wait for some time. And now in this season, I, our pastors, our church board, we all know that this is the time that if we don't act now, we are approaching that point that we will completely run out of room. And that's not an acceptable place to be for us, is it? We're not done growing. In fact, when you leave here tonight, we're going to give you more invite cards. Just keep inviting your friends and family members and neighbors. We'll just keep making room. We'll guilt trip more people from the AMs to come to the PMs. You know, whatever it takes, we'll do it. No, but listen, when we talk about building a building, it's not about a building, really. It's about the people whose lives are going to be changed forever in that building. It's an exciting season. I'll talk more about the details in the weeks to come, but just so you know a little bit of what to expect if we get favor with our city and get permits and if finances go well, we could start building this new facility as early as the beginning of this upcoming year. So this time next year, we could be getting ready to move into that building. But we need everyone in our church family to be bold and to pray bold prayers and to seek God's will. And he's going to ask us to, to do things that stretch our faith, like give and sacrifice. But we know that God has each and every one of you here for this season. He knew exactly what he was doing, and he brought you here for this season to be a part of what is happening in our church. So I'm talking about vision and what is happening in the future, and vision includes plans. We make plans, and this building is part of our plans, but plans are short-term, and that's really all you can do is come up with short-term plans because you don't really know what's going to happen in the future, right? We can make plans, and you should, to be responsible, but like Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. <laughs> so you can't control what opportunities are going to arise, what challenges will arise, but I want to talk about another part of vision that often gets neglected. I want to talk about church culture. We can't control what happens, but we can control the kind of people we become. And I would say that that can be even more important when you face challenges or opportunities. More important than always doing the exact right thing is becoming the right kind of person. Because if you become more like Jesus, you will be equipped for whatever life brings your way. So culture is who we are. It's how we do what God has called us to do. We don't know what we're going to face, but we know who we want to be when God brings these things across our path. We know how we want to live. So I'm going to talk about tonight something I've never preached on to our whole church, but our Generation Church team values. This is a very important part of our church, and it really will help you understand our culture and the kind of people that we want to be. This is something that, you know, we teach this to all of our team members, everyone who serves on a team, we teach them these values. Everyone that we hire to work on our church staff exhibits these values. It's mandatory. This is who we are. And now we're seeing that these values are trickling down through our teams from the oldest to the youngest. And we love it. Man, we're seeing teenagers quoting these values back to us. 
And what I love about these values is that they're biblically based principles that if you apply to your life, God can use you to do amazing things, but you can apply these to your life in all kinds of ways, personally, um, in your family, if you're a business leader, in your business as an employee. I had one business leader this morning tell me, I'm gonna make these team values my business employee values because they're just so good. If you'll make these values your values, I guarantee you will not be able to help but become successful and blessed in what you do. Because who you become determines the opportunity that God will entrust you with. Who you become determines how much responsibility God can trust you with. And the Bible shows us this. There's a parable that Jesus teaches that's called the parable of the talents. And the talents, talents were a measure of money, a lot of money actually, parable of the talents. And basically it says that a master was going away on a trip and he wanted to entrust his servants with a measure of money to use while he was gone to invest and to build. And so it says this in Matthew 25, verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag. So pause real quick. Why did he give them different amounts? Was it based on tenure, how long they'd been with him? Was it based on, I like this guy more than that guy? No, it says this in scripture. He gave to each according to his ability. Ability. This is very important because most of us want to do our best for Jesus. We want to be successful. We want to give our best so that the Lord will give us more opportunity and responsibility and influence. You want that, right? You want more responsibility and influence and opportunity in your life. But here's the thing. Sometimes we don't have the ability that it takes for the next level of opportunity and responsibility. And that's a hard truth, but it is a truth. And we will oftentimes tell ourselves that our abilities are fixed. And we'll say things like, well, this is just the way I am. I'm just good at that, and I'm not good at this. And the reality is our abilities are not fixed, but we can develop our abilities as we become more like Jesus. Our abilities spiritually, especially, they increase, and God can then entrust us with more opportunity and responsibility. So I am excited about these team values. If you will understand and implement these in your life, man, they will, they will change your life. You will find more opportunity comes your way, more responsibility comes your way. These will make you more successful. We had one of the teenagers that goes to our Awatuki campus. She's not even 18 years old. Her name's Mia. She went to a job interview and her potential employer was interviewing her and she started just rattling off these team values. Well, I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do this and they were blown away because teenagers don't talk this way. They were like, boom, hire that girl right now, hire her. See, if you put this into practice in your life, you will be blessed. So here's what we do. But here's how we do it. Here's who we are. Okay, so our team values, number one, I'm going to rattle them off to you pretty quick tonight. Number one, we do whatever it takes. We are committed to doing whatever it takes in our effort to carry out the mission of Jesus Christ. We want to reach people who are far from God and help them experience new life in Jesus. And we're willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. There are a lot of people that talk a big game about wanting to accomplish great things in life. But then when you really get down to it, they're not always willing to do what it takes to get the results. So they'll talk, you know, I'm going to lose weight this year and I'm going to get in shape. And then they find out I'm going to have to deny myself and exercise. This isn't really a good year for me when it comes to that. Uh, I want to build a business. Wait, that's going to be scary. Oh, I want to save money and amass wealth. Wait, I'm going to have to make some changes. It's easy to talk about doing great things it's hard to actually do what it takes. It's hard to, to, to be the kind of person who will do whatever it takes. Now, spiritually, there are churches, there are pastors who they say they want to reach lost people, but they're really not willing to do whatever it takes to reach lost people, if we're being honest. Here's the thing. When we talk about something as important as reaching the lost, when you talk about worldly accomplishments, physical accomplishments, things like getting in shape or building a business or saving money. Those are good things, but all of those good results will eventually fade. You can get a six pack and not the kind you drink, the kind you, (laughs) but eventually you're going to sag and bag because gravity always wins. (laughs) 
right? You can build a business, but eventually that business will probably go out of style. You can amass a great fortune, but eventually someone else is going to spend that wealth. But when it comes to spiritual accomplishments, spiritual accomplishments, those things never fade away. When we talk about reaching lost souls, these are people who are going to spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. Right? You'll, we'll, you'll be friends with the people we reach through our church a thousand years from now in heaven, and they'll be thanking you still for what you did to help build the kingdom of God. So I think about the apostle Paul. He says in 1 Corinthians 9, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. When I was with those who follow the Jewish law, I too lived under that law, even though I'm not subject to the law. I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from that law so I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. In other words, I don't sin. When I am with those who are weak, I share their weakness for I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save some. I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessing. This attitude says... I will do whatever it takes. When I'm hanging out with Jewish folks, I'm going to talk about kosher food and whatever they want. to. When I'm with Gentiles, I'm not worried about Jewish tradition. If I'm hanging out with athletes, I'm going to talk about LeBron James. If I'm with business guys, we can talk about business in the stock market. I don't care what it takes. I will do it. If it's not clearly a sin, I will do it if that allows me to reach lost people and help them come to Christ. So, man, we're not looking to make excuses about how it's hard. Anything worth talking about, anything worth celebrating is hard. If it was easy, anyone would do it. Everyone would do it. Man, it's hard to accomplish great things for God, but we are willing to do whatever it takes. So I want to challenge you tonight personally. Is there anything in your life where God has called you to do something or he is asking you to do something, but maybe you've given up or made excuses or put it off, and right now the Holy Spirit is showing you it's time to change and take on an attitude, I will do whatever it takes to be who God is calling me to be, to do what he's calling me to do. Here's the second value. We show our passion. At Generation Church, you're going to notice, man, we just show our passion. We're passionate people, and I truly believe that people with passion make things happen. We're passionate here because the Lord is here. The Holy Spirit is here. And if you've come to this church for any amount of time, you sense God's presence here and you find that lives are being changed and the Holy Spirit is, is leading lost people to Jesus. And so we can't help but be joyful and celebrate. And it's, it's natural, actually, to show your passion when we're talking about loving the Lord, right? That, that's something that burdens me is when Christians love the Lord sincerely. I'm not questioning that, but they're not willing to show that passion. They've learned bad behaviors. It's weird to be a Christian and passionately celebrate a touchdown and then come to church and not passionately celebrate my risen Savior who saved me. Like, mm, that's cool. It's not normal. It's not right. That's actually what's weird. Psalm 95 verse 2 says, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. I mean, that's why we sing. That's why we clap. That's why we raise our hands. That's why we smile. That's why we greet each other with joy. We're emotional about God because we're grateful to God. And if you have ever felt a lack of emotion or a lack of passion for God, I would, rem I would encourage you to start thinking, to remind yourself about all the things that God has already done for you. And that gratitude will lead you to thankfulness. It'll lead you to joy. You'll find that passion again. I wanna challenge you to be the kind of person that shows your passion. People should be able to just look at you and know what you're passionate about. I can see a lot of you, you're passionate about the Cardinals. Me too. Some of you are passionate about other things, right? I just know I've observed you. I think we should be the kind of people that God just shines through us and other people know those are Jesus people. So let me challenge you in this. Just starting with simple things, like do you walk through life with just a frown on your face? Maybe it's just a thinking face. 
or a stinking thinking face, a perma frown. Turn that frown upside down, bro. You know, smile. Show people the love of the Lord in your heart. Just show your joy. Be someone who passionately shows love to other people. When you come to church, I mean, I want to encourage you, if you've never been the person who's willing to sing, maybe you like listening to other people sing, but you haven't sang because you think, I don't have a good voice. I want you to know we're not listening to you. That's why the music's so loud, so we don't have to hear anybody. Right? Just start to sing and enjoy it. It's actually good for you, and the Bible commands you to sing. If you've never clapped in church, hey, clap. Clap along with the music. doesn't matter if you clap on the one beat and the three beat or the two and the four. If you're white or if you're black, we don't care. It's an ethnically diverse church. Just join in. Right? Maybe you see people raising their hands in church. We talked previous weeks how the Bible says, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. That's biblical. Maybe you've seen other Christians doing that and you think, man, a part of me just wants to do that. I want to worship God with freedom and stop worrying about what I look like. Pride actually stops people from expressing passion sometimes. I want to encourage you to take a step forward in just expressing your love for the Lord. Maybe you thought, a part of me wants to, to raise my hands. Just, just do it. Just start with one. Yeah. Just like, even a low one. Just like kind of um, sneak it in there like a ninja, right? Just, just show your passion. Here's the three. Number three, we bleed GC. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> So we love the church of Jesus Christ. We love the other Bible-teaching, Jesus-loving churches in our community. But we specifically love this church, and we're not ashamed of it. As a pastor, sometimes it makes me sad because I talk to Christians. You know, what church do you go to? Oh, I go to, you know, such and such church. Do you love it? Yeah. It's okay. I think, man, that's sad. Can you imagine? Hey, man, do you love your wife? Meh. <laughs> She's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we love our church, and it's okay to love your church. We bleed GC. If you cut me, I bleed GC. Because Jesus loves his church. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. In John 2, 17, it says, Then his disciples remembered this prophecy from Scripture, Passion for God's house will consume me. Jesus loves the house of God. Yeah. If, our, if you're a Christian, this church might be an awkward place for you if you don't want to love your church. <laughs> you can still come here, but you'll just notice the other people here, they love their church. And if you're not a Christian or you bring a, an unsaved, a, a non-believing friend or family member to church, they're welcomed. We're not going to force them to do anything. It's a safe place. But if you are a Christian, the way we do it is we love our church. And you'll notice people wearing their church T-shirts and their rocking generation church decals on their car. I want to just encourage you just to love your church and show your love for your church. Pray for your church. Get plugged in. Be a part of a life group. It's so important. Serve on a team. Man, just go all in. You'll be shocked at how your love for your church will lead to great things, to opportunities to share Jesus. In all seriousness, I've met dozens of people who got saved and it started with a conversation in a parking lot when someone saw a church sticker on a car. Right. Yeah. Okay, what church is that? Oh, that's my church. You should come. And they come and they find Jesus. So show your love for your church. Four, never stop growing. This is a value for our church, for our team. So personally, I want to challenge you, never stop growing. Keep pushing yourself. Read. Uh, be around people who are ahead of you. Learn from them. Professionally, stretch yourself. But most importantly, never stop growing spiritually. None of us have arrived. None of us are perfect. We all have room to grow. Jesus is perfect. The rest of us are progressing. And we're, by God's grace, we're getting closer. We're getting better. We can all become more like Jesus. So here's the thing. Healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. And so as a healthy church, we can't help but grow. We're not apologizing for it. And, and there are people out there that will say, I don't like big churches. And that attitude, I understand it, but I've never heard a better alternative. Yep. Yeah. What's the alternative to a healthy church growing? Are we supposed to grow and then say, that's enough. 
I know there are more lost people in the community, but we don't want any more of them here. They're going to have to find another. No room in the inn. Lock the doors. We're done. No, that's not acceptable. That doesn't honor God's heart. The only reason to resist church growth for a Christian is if you care more about what you've got than what's lost. I care more about my tradition and my convenience and doing things the way I've always done them and what's comfortable and what's familiar. But here's what's a lot more important. Lost souls, people who need the Lord. They're more important than tradition. They're more important than convenience. Church growth is something that God is for. In Acts 2, 47, it says, Each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. If God didn't want healthy churches to grow, he really messed up there. He should have slowed down, right? There's not one shred of evidence in Scripture that God wants anything else other than a healthy, growing church. Here's just another one example. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4 says, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. How many people does God want to be saved? All. 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 Jesus came to seek and save the lost. The Bible says God is not wanting anyone to perish, but all to be saved. So when we talk about growing personally, professionally, and spiritually, we want to do what God is leading us to do. When it comes to our church, we talk about building this building in our next season. We've got projects at our Awatsuki campus to make more room there because that campus is growing as well. But we're not building a building because we're in love with buildings. It's not about that building, right? We're creating room for people who need new life in Jesus. If you've read your Bible, buildings will all fade away. They might last 100 years, 200 years, but people, their souls, they will live on for eternity. So I want to challenge you now personally. Is there any area in your life where maybe you need to grow? Could there be a part of your life where you've allowed yourself to become stagnant? It happens to us sometimes. We become stagnant spiritually. And so if you have become stagnant, it's time to grow. And how do you grow? It's not just by determining to become a better person. It's not through hard work. It's honestly through proximity to Jesus Christ. As you spend time reading his word, read the Bible, you're, you're, you're consuming what he said. As you serve other people, you're doing what he does. As you pray, you're talking to him. And intimacy with Jesus leads to spiritual growth. It will bring fresh water into your soul. So don't stop growing. Living things grow, and growing things change. And we're willing to change if it means we can reach more people. Amen? Here's the fifth value. Honor. Honor up, down, and all around. We want to be known as people of honor. We want to treat people better than they deserve. This isn't the kind of church where you have to earn our respect. We're going to respect you. We're going to honor you because God created you. And so it starts with this. We live in a country, we have to understand the context, we live in a country that is rooted in dishonor for authority. You could make the argument that that's how we got our start. <laughs> and so rebellion towards authority actually permeates through many parts of our society. Children tend to be disrespectful to their parents more often than not. Disrespectful to teachers. As we grow up, this carries on. We tend to be disrespectful towards government officials towards our employers, towards our pastors, and what that really is a reflection of is dishonor for God. Because God says, honor your leaders. So this is a very important issue. It goes back to the fifth commandment, which says, honor your father and mother. It's the first commandment with a promise, honor your father and mother, and you will live a long life. God wanted us to learn from a very young age that if we honor authority, we will be blessed. Yes. See, you need to know this. Blessing always follow, follows honor for authority. Yes. Right. It's not popular teaching. It's just true. <laughs> so I'll, I'll just show you this through the negative. Mark 6, verse 4. Jesus goes to his hometown where he grew up, and he, it says this. Then Jesus told them, a prophet, he's referring to himself, is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them. 
So what's going on there? Jesus went back to his hometown where he grew up on the block. Now he's Jesus, the son of God. He's been doing ministry around the countryside, healing the sick, feeding the hungry, casting out demons, preaching the good news. Comes to his own hometown and he says, I'm not honored here. Everywhere else, I'm honored. Here, no, it's not with my home, not with my, my, my relatives, the people I grew up with. And it said he could do no miracles among them. So what happened is Jesus came ready to love people and do miracles, but he couldn't. Why? Is it because he forgot to charge up his spiritual batteries that day? Did he lose his power? No, he can't lose his power. It's because the people there didn't honor him. He was ready to do miracles, but they said, who do you think you are? Talking like you're the son of God or something. We remember you, you're, you're Joseph's son, Jesus of Nazareth. You're the carpenter's son. We played kickball with you. Yeah. Remember when you scraped your knee, why should we listen to you? So here's Jesus ready to heal them, but they didn't show up for the miracle. So when you don't honor authority, you miss out on God's blessing. So it starts with this. When you submit your life to God and you honor God by surrendering and admitting, I can't save myself, I can't earn salvation, you say, God, I need you to save me. I'm going to accept Jesus as my king. What happens is then blessing flows down. You are blessed as your sins are forgiven and you receive eternal life. That's a pretty great blessing, isn't it? The most important blessing you'll ever Ever receive. This principle is true in all areas of your life. As a child honors his or her parent, they're blessed. Yes. Any parents here tonight? Do you honor your kids when they rebel and defy you? No, you punish them. You bless them when they obey you and do what you ask them to do. So I'm trying to teach you that honor is important to us because we know that honor leads to blessing. So we want to honor those who are in authority over us, and we're all under authority. We want to honor those who serve alongside us. We want to honor those who we're serving, right? Those who come in as guests. We want to honor people who are still rough around the edges, who don't know Jesus. They might not know the truth. They might do and say things that, you know, Christians wouldn't say or shouldn't say, but we're still going to treat them with respect and love as valued guests. They're VIP. We're going to honor children. You know, they're, they're weak. They're small. They don't have a lot to contribute yet, but we're going to honor them because we honor we are people of honor. What about you? Here's a challenge. This is the most challenging one of the night, I think. Have you been a person of honor? Do you honor others? Do you have that attitude like, we've got to earn my respect? Are you rebellious towards authority or honoring towards authority? And you know you're rebellious towards authority if you say things like, well, you can't tell me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. You're not the boss of me. Even if your boss makes you do something, you look for ways to defy him secretly, maybe so you won't get in trouble, but you're going to stick it to him, right? It's just something to think about. As a Christian, we want to be honoring to God by honoring authority. Here's number six. Church should be fun. Church should be fun. There are a lot of churches that are good at teaching the truth, but they're not good at having fun. And we think you can do both. Because Jesus is fun. And his church should be fun too. I'll prove it to you. Mark 2.15 says, While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Now, you can say what you will about sinners. They've got their issues. But one thing they are good at is having fun. <laughs> We've got to admit it. It's true. They know how to have a good time. So just think about it. Do you think tax collectors and other notorious sinners wanted to be around Jesus because he was boring and stuffy and religious? He was fun. He was loving. He was fun. When you actually read what he said, you start to realize he was also funny. He was fun, so we should be fun as well. Church can be fun. It's weird to be Christians who want to be like Jesus and then be boring and stuffy in a way that, man, no wonder so many kids grow up not wanting to go to church. Church should be fun. Think about the passage that talks about kids wanting to come to Jesus. The disciples tried to stop them. Remember Jesus said, let the children come to me? Do you think kids wanted to be with Jesus because he looked mean and was religious and judgmental? 
Or do you think it was because, man, that guy looks like a lot of fun. I want to go play with him. Jesus was fun. So church should be fun. We serve a risen Savior, so we should live like it. Remember, Jesus shows us you can be holy and have fun. You can party and you don't necessarily need drugs and alcohol, right? You can be righteous and fun. It's possible. So a church gathering is primarily a celebration of victory. And I love our church because you won't have to drag your kids here. They'll drag you here. That's part of our strategy, actually. (laughs) Number seven, make it attractive. Make it attractive. This is a value for our team, for our staff. We want to do everything in a way that It's attractive. And here's what I mean by that. People were drawn to Jesus Christ. So they should be drawn to the way that we present him. We shouldn't be weird, weird Christians that freak people out. You know, Jesus was supernaturally attractive to people because all humans are searching for what only Jesus can provide. We all have a hunger and a thirst in our souls, and we'll try different things to satisfy us, drugs, sex, influence, power, right? But we find that those things leave us empty, yet Jesus is the living water, and when we drink of the living water, he says, we'll never thirst again. In John 12, verse 9, it says, when all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him. So this wasn't just church people, this was the whole community. They heard Jesus was coming, and they said, Man, let's go check that out. That guy is saying some really amazing things. He's doing some amazing things. I hear that he's incredible. Let's go. They flocked to him. He's attractive. And I would say that churches where people aren't coming are probably doing something wrong. Because people are drawn to Jesus. Let me just challenge you. If people don't like being around you, maybe you need to become more like Jesus. Right? John 12, 32 says this, Jesus is talking, he says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So we can think about it this way. We wanna be the kind of church that lifts up Jesus. No matter what we do, he will always be the hero. When we talk about our stories, Jesus is the hero. We're not the hero of our story, honestly. Like, my story is not, well, then I got my act together and went to church, and I really picked myself up by the bootstraps. No, I'm not the hero. Jesus, I was a sinner. I made mistakes. I failed. I couldn't save myself. And then Jesus, he came in, and he saved me, and he changed me. So if Jesus is the hero in our topic of conversation and our object of affection, people will come to our church. People will be drawn to you as Jesus shines through you because Jesus is attractive. Number eight, I'm keeping on going here. We don't have that much time left. Number eight, this is a value for our team. We want to reject good for great. God deserves our best. Even if it takes more time and requires more energy, we're not the kind of people who want to settle for good enough. Man, we don't want to settle for good. If you hire a company to do work for you, would you be happy if they showed up? Oh, I'm here today to do a good enough job. I know. No, I paid you to do a great job, bro. I want you to give me your best. I want you to work with excellence. And honestly, I think God feels the same way. A lot of times Christians can spiritualize their own laziness. And they'll say things like, well, I did my best, and now I'm going to trust God to do the rest. And in reality, I want to say, did you really do your best? Because if that's your best, they'll say, well, I know I should work hard, but I think I just need to rest and just let God take care of me. Well, you know, God works through those who work. I would just challenge you. Are you really doing your best? Are you rejecting good for great? Are you practicing? Are you preparing? Are you looking for ways to make it better? Because I would say if anyone deserves our best efforts, it's Jesus Christ. Colossians 3.23 says, Work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. This is a really challenging way to think. If you thought, man, everything I do, I'm going to act as though I'm doing this for Jesus and not my parents, not my boss. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sweep this floor like Jesus is about to walk on this floor. I'm going to welcome people to the church like I'm welcoming Jesus to the church. 
When my boss asks me to take the trash out, I'm going to do it like Jesus is watching, and I'm taking Jesus' trash out. You know I'm going to get every last piece, and I'm going to wipe it down to the best of my... If I've got to feed Jesus, I don't want to give him a microwave dinner. I want to serve him a seven-course gourmet meal because he deserves our best effort. And we know he doesn't love us more when we perform with excellence. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. He loves us the same. He, uh, uh, his love for us is not based on our performance, right? It is based on the performance of Jesus. And he never fails. He never falters. And so that means God continuously loves you with the utmost affection. He doesn't love you less when you fall. He doesn't love you less when you come up short. But we want to do our best because he deserves our best effort. We do know that when we come up short, God's grace, he still covers over our weaknesses, right? But we are gonna give him all that we got because he deserves it. So let me challenge you. Has there been any aspect of your life where maybe you settled for good enough? Or deep down, you know, man, I can do better. I can do better. And you might, you might know what it is. You know what it is. It could be professionally. It could be with your spouse. It could be with your kids. And you've been saying, that's good enough. But God wants you to go for great. Reject good for great. Hey, maybe someone is here tonight. You're dating a guy and you've settled for good enough. You need to text him right now. It's over. <laughs> Hashtag reject good for great. Number nine is a value for our team. We lead from the front. I, I tell our team, people are watching you. And so you've got to show them the way. And they can't follow you to a place that you refuse to go. And everyone who's a part of our Generation Church family, you need to know you're not here by accident and that new people are placing their faith in Christ every single week and they're watching you. You're their example. They're going to follow you. I think about 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. The apostle Paul said, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. So this is how we should live our lives. If I didn't have time to preach a sermon or to show you what the Bible said, could I say, well, listen, just follow me and do what I do as I follow Christ, and you're going to become more like Jesus. Are you living your life that way? Are you living your life in a way that if new Christians followed you, they'd become more like Jesus? I, I just want to challenge you. If more people did what you do, would the kingdom of God advance? The Lord is challenging us to be the kind of people other people can follow our example as we follow Christ. Man, we want to lead from the front. We want to be the kind of people that can just walk up to new Christians and say, follow me, do what I do. I'm going to read my Bible, just, just read your Bible. I'm going to pray, just listen to me pray. You can pray like I pray. And, and they're going to see we're not perfect, right? They're going to see, man, sometimes I fall, I sin, but they're also going to see I'm going to repent of my sins and then go forward in joy in, in God's grace. You know, follow my example as I follow Christ. Are you living your life in a way people can follow your example? And then here's the last one, number 10. We get to give. It's a value for our team. It's a value for our church. It's an attitude that we have about giving of our lives, of our time, and of our treasure. It's not something that we have to do. It's something that we get to do. We don't have to give as Christians. We don't have to give to be saved because Jesus already paid the price for your salvation. Your debt's already been erased. Your entrance into heaven, the fee's already been paid. You've already been adopted into God's family. You're the recipient of the inheritance that Jesus has earned. That's right. You don't have to give. You get to give. It's a privilege, and generosity really is a privilege because being generous in giving is one of the most Christ-like things we can do. Yes. Think about Jesus. He gave it all for us. So at our church, when we talk about giving... And I bring this up especially because we're talking about a building and buildings cost money and it's going to take all of us praying and giving and sacrificing. But listen, I need you to know this. At our church, you are never, ever going to be pressured into giving. You're never going to be manipulated into giving. You're never going to be yeah. guilt-tripped into giving. If you don't give, we're not sending Vinny and Tito to your house to pressure you, <laughs> break your legs, right? <laughs> Because we don't have to give. We get to give. We do teach what the Bible says about finances. 
Because like I said, you don't have to give to be saved, but there's a difference between being saved and being blessed. You don't have to do a lot of things to be safe, but you're only blessed when you do what God commands you to do. So we teach what the Bible says about finances. We teach about tithing, and I think tithing is a biblical principle that, man, when we follow this principle as Christians and we honor God with our finances by bringing him the first 10%, God always honors. He blesses those who honor him. And it's to honoring him with finances. And he says, honor me with the first fruits of all your wealth. Just bring the whole tithe into my house. And if you weren't here when we taught on the blessed life, go back on our app, get on YouTube and watch that sermon series. There's a lot of people here living the blessed life. And some people are still figuring this out. They're still learning about tithing. They're still learning to trust God with their finances. But what you'll learn is that 90% with God's blessing is going to take you way farther than 100% without God's blessing. Yeah. So... Man, I'm really passionate about that. And then we talk about when you give above and beyond your tithe, that's an offering. And it's different than tithing. Tithing is something I think all Christians should do no matter what. Giving above and beyond that is something you only do when the Holy Spirit leads you to do that. It's just something you do because you know God is telling you to do it, and it's not something you should ever be pressured into. So here's an example in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and he's asking them to help with another church in Macedonia. And you know he's not talking about tithing. He's talking about helping another church, giving above and beyond sacrificially. And I love what he says in chapter 9, verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. In other words, he doesn't want you to be pressured or guilt-tripped. He doesn't want you to give reluctantly, like, oh, fine, get off my case. He wants you to become a cheerful giver. There are three types of people when it comes to giving. There are cheerful givers, there are cranky givers, and there are cranky (laughs) non-givers. Cheerful givers, they give cheerfully. Cranky givers, they give, but it's only because they were pressured into it and then maybe they regret it. Cranky non-givers, well, all non-givers are cranky, I would say. Notice there's no such thing as a cheerful non-giver. Because you see in Scripture again and again that joy and generosity are linked directly together. Man, I want us to become cheerful givers because... The Lord Jesus is a cheerful giver. I have a friend, I asked him a couple of weeks ago, why are you so generous? He's really just generous and it was inspiring me. Like, why are you, why'd you do that? He said, well, growing up, my dad said, you can be a giver or a taker. Wow. And I wanna be a giver. And I just thought, man, what am I gonna be? Let me ask you, who, who are you gonna be? Are you gonna be a cheerful giver? As we give, we become more like Jesus. And we really don't have to, we get to. That's what's so beautiful about this. You're saved whether or not you give. God loves you whether or not you give. You're going to heaven if you trusted Jesus to save you, whether or not you give. But Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. And we know, man, I don't have to give, I get to give. And I love giving to Jesus because I love Jesus. So you're going to find that this is a joy to give. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads at this time as we close. I want to pray for you. God, we thank you for your favor on our church and on our lives individually. And I pray for your blessing on every person here, Lord. Lord, will you show us areas in our lives where we can grow to become more like Christ? Where we're weak, Lord, we want your encouragement to grow. Where we're strong, we want humility that we'd always give you the glory. As your people, we want more anointing. We want more of your power in our lives so we can do what you've called us to do. We give you all the credit and all the glory for all the great things that have happened in this church. But God, we know that the best days are still ahead. And every single person in this church right now is here on purpose according to your will for such a time as this. The things that you have called us to do, we are the people who are called to carry those things out. So Lord, use us. We want to be the kind of servants that you can trust with more responsibility, with more opportunity, and we will do whatever it takes to reach lost people in Jesus' name. Let me just ask you this while your heads are bowed. 
If you're here and you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you know, I, I need to surrender my life to him, I need his forgiveness, or maybe you have accepted him a long time ago, but then you've been running from God. And maybe you've been far from God and he's calling you to come home to the father like the prodigal son to return to God. And if you're ready to be close to God, again, if you're ready to accept Jesus, if you want forgiveness, if you want eternal life, then pray this prayer with me. Just say, Jesus, I need you. I know that I've sinned, but I believe you died on the cross to pay the price for my sins. I believe you rose again so I can have eternal life. I surrender my life to you. I trust you to save me. I trust you to lead me. And I love you because you first loved me. In Jesus' name, amen.